It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susie Thibodeau, our grand round speaker today. Um, Susie completed her undergrad studies at Tulane University in New Orleans. And then she was unfortunately displaced from New Orleans as she started medical school there um, due to Hurricane Katrina. And I think actually Dr. Cohn can, can uh, sympathize with that as well. Um, so she ultimately then received her MD and PhD from UT San Antonio before heading to Penn for her clinical pathology residency in blood banking and transfusion medicine fellowship. And then she joined the faculty um, at WashU in St. Louis, where she's now an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Immunology. Um, she's accomplished a lot in a short time in her career, and she holds several leadership roles, including medical director of the Apresis Center and the Cell Therapy Lab uh, at Barnes Jewish Hospital. And she's also the director of the WashU Blood Banking and Transfusion Medicine Fellowship Program. I met Susie several years ago through the AVB mentoring program, and we've worked together on a few studies through the Biomedical Excellence for Safer Transfusion, our best collaborative. Um, it's been a pleasure collaborating with her over the years, and, and again, it's now my pleasure to introduce her this morning for her presentation on uh, exploring challenges and opportunities of cellular therapy product collections. Susie. Thank you, Dr. McKenna, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. It's really an honor to be here today to speak to you all. I did hear the weather is uh, ple pleasant up there right now, um, but I know in February it could be a little dicey. Um, it's really an honor, so let's get started. I'm really excited to talk to you about um, discovering challenges and then trying to think of ways through opportunities that we can continue to work through successful ther cell therapy product collections. I do have the chat open, but I'm likely not going to be looking at it just for your information, but feel free to put questions in the chat as you go. And I'm also going to turn my video off just to optimize the video, uh, the, the running smoothly of this presentation, but I'll turn it back on at the end. Okay, so um, just disclosures. I have no relevant financial disclosures, but I do just like to make sure I let you know that uh, the major portion of this talk will discuss a project that I did as part of a subcommittee initiative in the American Society of Apheresis. And I am a member of the board of directors for the Association for the Advancement of Blood and Biotherapies. So some learning objectives for today. Um, by the end of this talk, I'm hoping you'll be able to describe the general process of apheresis collections for cell therapy products. We're going to focus on CAR T cells because that's the best characterized, but we may touch upon some others as well. Discuss challenges in providing collection services for multiple cell therapy products and review some potential strategies to encourage alignment of apheresis collection practices. So chimeric antigen receptor T cell manufacturing starts and ends with the patient. So this is an autologous collection where this little arm here where the patient's actually cut off, it comes from the patient and then ultimately goes back in. But there are many steps in between. So I do apologize for the blurriness of this. This did not look like this when I put it in here, but I'll walk you through this verbally. So when the process happens, we're collecting by leukapheresis and you can see the red cells, this is patient's unstimulated blood. So the patient hasn't taken any medications to get this blood out of their body. Blood is processed through an apheresis machine, which helps to concentrate it into the white blood cells with the little colored dots here. And then it's sent off to the lab. The process here actually has to do with the cell therapy lab, packaging it and shipping it and taking care of the safety of that um, product storage and transportation. And then it is purified by a process called elutriation, which is a counterflow centrifugation, as well as potentially magnetic cell separation. So we're trying to separate out the T cells, the cells that we want to manufacture into CAR T cells from the rest of the white blood cells. Then we want to uh, actually introduce the um, uh, genetic material into the T cell. We also want to stimulate them. We want to activate them to actually expand and proliferate. So once we put the genetic material in, either by viral vector over here, you can see the little flask over here and the little viruses, or there's other ways called uh, electroporation is one example, but the one over here is actually the one with the viral vectors is the one that has gone through the FDA approval process and is now in commercial use. Now you've got CAR T cells. 
So they've got that genetically modified material. And then you're going to expand them to proliferate to get them into large cell numbers. And then again, formulate them into your dose, freeze them, transport them back for thawing and infusion back into that same patient. So that's in general describing the process of CAR T cell manufacturing. We're going to focus on apheresis, so that black box right there. So here's an apheresis machine, um, not characterized by any identifying information. And if you looked into this little um, circle here, which I encourage any of you to do if you're ever seeing an apheresis process, you'll actually see the blood being separated into these tubes. So this is actually a little, looks a little bit like what it would actually look like if you looked in there. Cells are separated out by specific gravity into their uh, blood components. And we're going to focus on the lymphocyte collection, although these can all be separated out. The specific gravity separates out plasma, platelets, white blood cells of many different types, and red blood cells. And we can do that for therapeutic purposes or for donor purposes. And today we're talking about donor uh, collection for the manufacturing of CAR T cells. So we're specifically going to focus on lymphocytes, even more specifically the cells of interest are T cells. There's a lot of collection considerations before, during, and after apheresis though. If we're thinking about a patient-centric process there's a lot of considerations that actually work into that patient walking in the door, getting a successful collection of um, cellular starting material, and then making it through to the end of actually getting that infusion. So some general considerations before apheresis ever happens is actually very multifactorial. So the patient's general health is important to consider. Can the patient actually tolerate apheresis collection? Can they tolerate the turnaround time for CAR T cell manufacturing? Um, when CAR T cells were first starting, the manufacturing process took several weeks. Now it, it takes a lot less time, but it can vary depending on a lot of different factors. So being able to ensure that the patient can make it through to infusion is important uh, in, in such a, a health status that they can tolerate the infusion itself. The diagnosis, so the clinical indication for CAR T cells, there's several now, and there's different CAR T cells that can um, target different diseases. And this is an important one, coordinating cessation of therapies that could affect CAR T cell quality. So clinicians may have to think back actually several months and stop therapies that could affect T cell function. Predetermined requirements. So we're going to talk a little bit about FDA approved therapies, but we're going to really focus a lot on clinical studies today. What are those predetermined requirements? And I think at the end, you'll see that they're all over the place. Patient access, so this is vascular access, um, peripheral access versus central access. Oftentimes these patients just, they don't have adequate veins to support the flow rates required for apheresis and do require central access, which means they have to have a procedure to place a line. That has to happen before we can ever collect. Peripheral blood counts, there may be laboratory values that need to be uh, reaching or surpassing th certain thresholds, such as the CD3 count for T cells. Uh, CBCs, just to make sure that they have the adequate parameters in place for actually proceeding with a safe apheresis collection, such as hemoglobin or hematocrit or platelet count. And um, active peripheral disease may actually compromise collection as well. Um, prior therapies. So what is the last therapy that they got and when did they get it? And then scheduling. So this is the patient access that doesn't have to do with vascular access, but it has to do with their access to healthcare. Where do they live? Are they in proximity to a place that can offer CAR T cell collections um, and infusions? And time slot availability for CAR T cells manufacturers and apheresis collections. This used to be a pretty big deal, especially when cells needed to be sent fresh um, because it was a very manufacturing centric process. It had to do with the time slot availability for those manufacturers. Many cells actually now can be frozen before they're sent off, which um, actually makes it a much more patient-centric process. The patient can have their cells collected, we can freeze them down, and they can be manufactured and stored until such time that it can uh, come back and be infused into the patient. So during apheresis, again, these are points that we're gonna talk a little bit about later as well. Um, total blood volume, how long does the patient need to be on the machine? How, how much volume do we actually need to process? Extracorporeal volume, so how much volume is outside of this patient at any time. The average uh, volume outside of the patient in an apheresis machine is about 
uh, 240 mils, give or take. So I like to equate that to eight ounces. If you think about the coffee cup, you may or may not be holding or bottle of water collection goals. So how does that affect processing volume and time spent on the machine? Oftentimes manufacturers have specific goals and we're trying to figure out how to reach them, not having all of the information in hand in real time. Anticoagulant used. So um, practices may vary uh, using ACDA or citrate anticoagulation versus heparin anticoagulation. Many of these CAR T cell products don't allow for heparin to be used during anticoagulation. And so that's an important consideration. Anticipated adverse events during apheresis. So the need for potential calcium supplementation with citrate anticoagulation and uh, collection efic efficiency. So that may be variable based on a lot of different factors um, specific to institution, apheresis machine, software, operator, many variables at play there. And then after apheresis. So what's actually in the bag? So determining the need for, for T cell selection or lymphocytes enrichment, some of those processes that I showed you earlier um, might be stepwise decisions that need to happen with the product once it's in the manufacturer's hands. We don't know, of course, what's in the bag. We know there's white cells in the bag, but that doesn't get characterized until after collection. And um, how does that cellular comp composition have the potential to affect the manufacturing process and successes there? Um, can it actually affect the um, ability for that genetic material to get into the cells? Manufacturing techniques, so what kinds of systems are used? Is there automated system, media used? Manufacturing time. So you can see this could affect the overall process since many manufacturing labs are not just processing one patient at any given time, they're processing several patients. But that could actually have a playback onto individual turnaround time and back into the individual patients. So um, apheresis collection practices, how do we actually figure out what those targets we were talking about a little bit earlier, how do we know what they are? And um, this is actually proven to be a little difficult. And I think you can see that based on some of these blank spaces in this table, where I looked at the um, some of the uh, pivotal studies that uh, led to the CAR T cells uh, that are not mentioned by name here, but that ended up being FDA approved to see what was listed in those in those studies. And um, I want I'm giving you an overview here, but I do want to take a moment to to shout out Teddy Mamo at your institution, who uh, gave a great talk at AABB this last year, looking at even more detail. And um, it's actually a really eye opening process to see what's listed in papers versus protocols versus manuals, etc. But ALC threshold, so that's absolute lymphocyte count. So that still doesn't talk about T cells, but at least gets at the lymphocytes where the T cells are. You can see two different thresholds here. They're pretty low thresholds, which is good considering a patient may have a relatively low absolute lymphocyte count. So allowing for a patient to proceed, given that they may be relatively diminished in that pool is really uh, good, but knowing whether they're 100 uh, ALC per microliter versus 500 is actually a pretty, could be a pretty big difference. And if you're talking about a patient who would qualify for one versus not the other, means everything to them. The CD3 positive uh, cell threshold, so those are T cells. You can see here in study three versus four, uh, two out of six studies had a T cell threshold. They're relatively um, similar-ish, but then again, if a patient qualifies for one but not the other, that could, that could mean everything to them. And volume processed, again, various definitions of that. Um, some are targeting volumes of the product, so a 600 milliliter product. Some are based on the pre apheresis CD3 count. Um, some have a target number of cells in the bag, uh, 400 times 10 to the six cells in the bag. And um, one processes two total blood volumes with a target number of cells. So again, what we're seeing here is that most of them had targets, but they're quite variable. And I pulled out an example from a biologic license application because that's the application that um, products have uh, manufacturers submit to the FDA for approval. And in the leukapheresis, it says 12 to 15 liter apheresis with a target collection of five to 10 times 10 to the ninth mononuclear cells. And uh, six of six of the CAR T-cell FDA package inserts 
uh, talked about standard leukophoresis procedures, which, uh, what does that mean? Could mean a lot of things. So if we're talking about clinical studies, we're talking about these that are oftentimes very multi-center and they're large. So if you've got, and this is just an example, five sites, and of course that's probably an underestimate for many studies, there's lots of different asks, uh, five sites and five studies. So if you've got site one that has their standard of care processes, but five different studies are asking for five different things, um, that could be potentially a challenge. And if you've got study number one, asking sites one through five for one thing, but they're all saying, well, I have my own way of doing things. Now the studies have to also grapple with how to align those processes. And then, of course, I'll just play on the error here. You've got this arrow here where it's kind of off in nowhere. And sometimes that happens where you can have a question that doesn't seem to make much sense. And then you need to even work with the manufacturer or the site or the potential stakeholders to figure out where in that process something fits in. So it could look like this big spider web of different different expectations and different um, requirements and different processes and it can get quite tangled. So published studies, um, I'm using the um, iceberg analogy here. They're approved for clinical use. They may already be committed to their own processes. And so right now we're looking at a, a handful of FDA approved products, but I think we can all anecdotally say that we're aware of what we can't see underneath the sea. There is a lot of clinical studies going on. And are there opportunities for improvement there? Because as the process goes on and once something is approved, it could get a lot harder to change. So how can we look at this? So a couple of years ago, we were talking in our subcommittee about, you know, we all have these anecdotal experiences and I'm sure that uh, you, your institution may have these as well, where we know they're different. And we have all of this information, but a lot of it is protected behind the wall of clinical studies. And so we were trying to think about how we could really get at looking underneath the sea or pulling back the curtain. And we settled on um, clinicaltrials.gov because it's publicly available. And it was a, a thought at first. It was almost exploratory at first. We were just going to see what happened. Um, how many studies would we actually be able to look at? We were wondering what was actually listed, because although we could share our stories, there's only a certain amount that you can get. We wanted to learn a little bit more about what was being um, shared in this world. So we did a very pretty simple, pretty simple question that we posed to clinicaltrials.gov. So I put the date here because uh, clinicaltrials.gov is a dynamic um, search engine and database for clinical trials that can change. And so on July 1st, 2020, the, the first day maybe of some of the trainees in the audience, we searched for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. That's it. And we saw uh, what we were going to get. We automatic had inclusion of terms of CAR T cells, T lymphocytes and cellular therapies. And it was downloaded as a complete list of results so that we could actually search for the um, different components of the studies. And so, Really, our hypothesis was quite simple. The presence of apheresis collection and information available was going to be quite variable. That was what we thought. So to walk you through our process, I wanna just show it step by step where at the time there were 670 studies and later we can have a little fun if you wanna guess um, how many you think that number was today. I did the search this morning and put it in uh, this one of the slides at the end. So we had 670 studies. So just to put you to the bottom right, our approach again was we searched for chimeric antigen receptor T cells, and then we start we searched for each study description. So we actually went to each website um, where the study was listed and described and looked for apheresis. So 49 studies were immediately excluded because either they were long-term follow-up, studies of the effect on CAR T cells, other therapies, or things that just didn't directly relate to an apheresis collection by CAR T cells. So we ended up with 621 studies at that point. And then after that, 
we collected data in a systematic way. So the date the record was accessed and reviewed, the number of times apheresis was referenced, where in the study description it was referenced, the context or why in which it was referenced, and we're going to uh, focus a lot on that this morning, minimum threshold counts for white blood cells, absolute neutrophil counts, absolute lymphocyte counts, lymphocyte percent, CD3 T cell count, platelets, and hemoglobin. And those are things that may or may not have been directly related to the apheresis mentions, but are something that as apheresis providers, we care about because it may affect our ability to proceed with collections. And if transfusion was allowed for platelets and hemoglobin, so putting our, our transfusion medicine blood bank hats on for a moment, how could that have affected our use of blood products, our ability to stay within guidelines in which uh, practice is generally conducted? So getting right into it, we found out what we thought we knew was that mentions of apheresis is very, very variable. And so... You can see here, I've listed just the number of times apheresis is referenced in a given study. 299 studies out of 621 didn't reference apheresis at all. So there's your, your black um, half of the circle over here, but it's just left of half. So if you're a glass half full, maybe we can say this glass is just over half full um, because 322 studies did reference it at least once. Most of them referenced it just once, but hey, they still said it. Some referenced it 25 times. Um, was that meaningful? Well, that remains to be seen, at least at this point in the talk. But you can see it was referenced in just a little over half. So at least right now, we can say a little over half of the studies we know are mentioning apheresis, presumably to state that they're collecting. So... Within the number of studies that referenced them, there were over a thousand mentions individually. And this is where we're going to spend uh, much of our time right now to talk about where they're mentioned, but mostly we're gonna talk about why it's mentioned. So in a study description in the clinicaltrials.gov, you've list the locations are listed at the bottom where you've got inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, the detailed description, arms interventions, brief summary outcomes and study design. This is not in the order in which it looks on the study. You can see it's in decreasing order of prevalence. So most of these uh, mentioned it in inclusion criteria. So something about uh, them being included had to do with apheresis or something about them being excluded had to do with apheresis. So this tells us where it was mentioned in the study description, but as you can already tell by based on what I'm saying, it doesn't say anything about why. Why are they being included or excluded based on apheresis? So getting to the why actually involved a totally different approach to research that I was used to at the time. And I found it really eye-opening. So it's a, it's a form of qualitative research based on the grounded theory method where it's actually used a lot of time. This is used for a lot of times for um, things like focus groups or um, where you wanna get information based in language that you can then group together and form meaning out of. So in the grounded theory method, you've got mentions of apheresis and we can give them codes. So we came up with some groups of context or the why behind it was mentioned by which apheresis was mentioned and we can code them. And then based on those codes, we can start to group things together into categories. And then based on those categories, we can then start to group them together into overlying themes. And so that way we can start to make some sense out of what this, uh, what the statements of apheresis were even getting at. So here's an example of coding and I made it lab medicine uh, centric. So here's an example of the context and you can take a second to read them. I'll read a couple of examples and just take it in and see if any of this makes sense to you as an apheresis provider. Um, for the first one, you've got, uh, if apheresis is required to let collect blood, you have to have a certain coagulation status of PT and APPTT less than one point times the upper limit of, um, you, can, you have to have a serum creatinine of a certain threshold and an AST under a certain threshold. The next one might make a little bit more sense given what we just talked about, an adequate absolute lymphocyte count within one week. 
Uh, the third one might make some sense, meeting the following criteria. They got white blood cells, hemoglobins, platelet count. I'm not sure how much that would make sense actually for us, given what our certain thresholds would be. Um, and uh, the fourth one kind of makes sense, inadequate T lymphocytes. But the last one, um, I'm not really sure, but you have to have a fasting blood glucose within a certain context to be able to be performed. Okay. So the number of times that was referenced, this was also quite interesting to me because what you see is that there are certain number of studies that actually said the same thing almost in the same ways. And so it actually speaks a little bit to how the clinicaltrials.gov might be inspiring others to help set their parameters or some other mechanism that we just don't know about that they're able to share this information or learn from others. Maybe that's an opportunity. So then I coded it. So here, um, these aren't uh, perfect, but they were somehow to code them, especially if they were in one thing. So liver kidney coagulation test, absolute lymphocyte count, complete blood count, T cell count, and of course there's the other where it didn't really group into anything. Yep. And then into a category, and that category would be laboratory data. So just to show you this visually, our code, the liver kidney coagulation test, ALC, T cell counts, other were grouped into laboratory data. And then that was eventually grouped into a patient theme where the theme was uh, things about the patient that had to do with apheresis. So we're gonna break these out into individuals uh, in just a minute, into individual categories. But just to show you the overall picture, that uh, total N was 1,044. And with the number of times apheresis was mentioned. So we've got the numbers up here so you can see them. See, some are mentioned a lot and then some not so much. Here's the category. So we've got our codes, which we'll break out in a minute, but into the categories, we've got procedure and patient. Here we've got therapies, laboratory data, infectious diseases, surgeries, procedures, cardiopulmonary, reproductive, logistics, product quality, and then repeats in multiple categories. And then at the top, we've grouped them into their themes. So there's a procedure theme where the mention of apheresis was related to the actual procedure. Patient themes where it's related to the patient. A product theme where it's related to the actual product that's made. And then, of course, because it needed to happen, there was a miscellaneous category where other mentions were. But you can see those categories are actually quite small. And we didn't actually need to take them into account to gain insightful information from other categories. So focusing on the procedure theme, I just have a little um, miniaturized version of what we just showed you at the top so you can see it broken out. You can see the leftmost column that's procedure is on the leftmost side of this larger graph, and they're broken out into based on the colors. So in that category, in the procedure theme, you've got category of procedure and a category of patient and the code. So basically, most of the times apheresis was mentioned, it was in the context of the procedure as the collection method. Cells will be collected by apheresis, as an example, or collection parameters. Cells will be collected by uh, one blood volume processed by apheresis, something like that as an example. And then things get a little bit more interesting here because they start to talk about things that um, like venous access. So patient must have adequate venous access to proceed with apheresis. This was something that was um, copied uh, seen in a lot of different studies. Um, another one was no contraindications. And, you know, as apheresis providers, we can think about this in terms of, does that mean that if they have no contraindications from the clinician's perspective or the apheresis provider's perspective, it could actually allow for some needed flexibility to allow for patients to um, proceed with collections. Um, one of them I thought was, this one came up over and over again, and I noticed it because it was the exact same verbiage. They must have adequate venous access and no contraindications or no contraindications. And um, the verbiage, it just gets very interesting because you'll see the same interest uh, phrases over and over again. Uh, patient must tolerate apheresis or patient must have informed consent. And things like informed consent might be the only time apheresis is mentioned in a study. Um, so it implies a lot, but it doesn't actually maybe say all that much. So the patient, you notice I had a patient uh, code over here, 
had a patient category in the procedure theme, and now I've got a patient theme. So that patient category in the procedure theme is supposed to, it's procedure centric, where it's the patient can tolerate the procedure. The patient theme is where everything is really related to the patient. And we've got apheresis mentions. Uh, they were mostly, by and large, as you can see here, related to medication timing. So with therapies that they've gotten, most of them actually had to do with anti-cancer therapies. Most, the second most common was steroids. And this makes sense. If, as I mentioned earlier, um, considerations before apheresis, the uh, medications that have to be avoided have to do with what can affect T cell function. And anti-cancer therapies and steroids are, are some of those that very well could affect T cell function. Uh, you can see other cell therapies, multiple therapies, other investigational therapies, um, and others. So you can see that there's a lot of different ones. Why anticoagulation would be in there, I'm unsure, but um, lots of clinical studies, um, only one of the over 600. So laboratory data, I actually already showed you this one as the example earlier of coding and categorization. And so you can see that there are certain laboratories that were connected with um, the mentions of apheresis, but it was definitely the minority of studies and the minority of apheresis mentions. So infectious disease. So basically this has to do with a patient having an active infection or a recent vaccination or positive infectious disease testing. And that makes some sense, but you can see it's still only in a, a, a small number of studies. Now here I've got a procedure uh, category in the patient theme. And by that, it really has to do with, did the patient have a procedure that's not related to this procedure, this actual apheresis collection that could uh, impact things? So they mentioned surgery. And then interestingly, they also, in some instances, and in four of them mentioned apheresis. And um, if I recall correctly, at least one of them talked about plasmapheresis. I don't know why, but it's interesting to see what these studies are thinking about and what they're saying with regards to apheresis collection and how one type of apheresis collection might impact another. Cardiopulmonary status, so cardiac function or stroke or the need for O2 supplementation, and then reproductive co uh, considerations such as active uh, contraception or pregnancy status. So the product theme. So this really focused on product acceptability and feasibility. So you can see product quality, I put a uh, logistics and product quality and under miscellaneous, well, miscellaneous, there was a, not a better way to say it. But with product acceptability, it was basically apheresis needed to produce an acceptable product or product availability um, based on apheresis collection, something along those lines. And the logistics really had to do with the time frame and feasibility. So the time frame necessary for that apheresis product to be collected and manufactured or the feasibility of manufacturing based on apheresis collection. And then the miscellaneous had to do with repeats where maybe apheresis was mentioned twice in a phrase and it was in a, it didn't add any meaning. So maybe apheresis is used to collect a product, um, an apheresis, so an apheresis product is used to buy apheresis, something like that, where it's, it's used in, in context of its own mention. And then if apheresis was used to say, um, multiple categories. For instance, if apheresis um, could proceed if a patient had no contraindications, could tolerate apheresis, had adequate venous access and informed consent, and the necessary testing where it just started spreading across all of the different things. It still could be meaningful if many studies started to mention it that way, but you can see it was a very small number. So I end up with the same conclusion that I started with, but now my eyes at least got opened a little bit more to what studies are thinking about and at least mentioning on this database website where we didn't know before. So it's very interesting to me. So what about other considerations related to apheresis? Let's talk about hemoglobin thresholds and requirement and allowance for transfusion. So this was an N of 621 studies. And you can see here with regards to hemoglobin thresholds, and this may or may not have been connected to the mention of apheresis. This is just a separate threshold looking at whether or not it's there. Uh, most studies didn't have any threshold stated. 
That doesn't mean they didn't have a threshold. It just was not available for us to see. Um, that left 37.5 of the studies that did have something stated, whether it was qualitative, where they just said adequate hemoglobin, or whether they actually listed a threshold. So I pulled out all of the ones that listed a threshold over to the right-hand side, and then I color-coded whether or not transfusion was stated to be allowed, not allowed, or not defined. And you can see most of them didn't define whether or not transfusion was allowed, which could be helpful, actually, to allow for some flexibility. Um, and you can see with transfusion being allowed, that could also be helpful where they're saying that, okay, it's okay. In some of the more restrictive uh, studies where they said transfusion was not allowed, you can see we could be, as apheresis providers, perhaps in a bit of a quandary. If we found, let's say, a patient with a hematocrit of 19, hemoglobin of 6, and that pink where it says transfusion not allowed, our guidelines or our indications, we may require a higher hematocrit to even establish an adequate interface. And so we may be in a, you could actually theoretically find oneself in a situation where there's a patient who could theoretically qualify for apheresis collection to get CAR T cells manufactured, but then not actually be able to qualify for the actual procedure. Um, I personally have never seen this, but the fact that it was out there was notable to me. Um, other parts that I wanted to notice were, now we've got the blue up here, where you need a, a hemoglobin of 10 grams per deciliter. Um, that may be for various reasons, but does apheresis collection require a 10 grams per deciliter hematocrit to proceed with collection? Um, perhaps not. And so that could be another place where we get in a, a fuzzy area where it's maybe a little bit out of line with what the general transfusion guidelines would suggest. So let's look at platelets, the same approach. So most of them you can see down at the lower left-hand side did not define um, a platelet threshold, but many of them did, and that was helpful. So with regards to the threshold, you can see some peaks here in the 50,000 per microliter and the 100,000 per microliter, and then some in the middle of the 75,000 per microliter. And again, that, that black of not defining whether or not platelet transfusion were allowed, that doesn't mean that they didn't do it or didn't have a definition for it, but that wasn't defined. And if they didn't define it, perhaps, again, that could allow for some flexibility. Um, now you can see whether transfusion is allowed or not allowed. And the platelet thresholds go quite low, but um, fortunately, so do usually our allowance for um, platelet, num platelet uh, threshold to proceed with apheresis. It could be individual or institution dependent, of course, but having that flexibility could be helpful. So now I wanna just show your attention to the upper level where maybe you can see that there's a requirement for 100,000 platelets per microliter to proceed and transfusion would be allowed to meet that threshold. I am not aware of um, any guideline for apheresis collection for that, but it is something to be considering if for some reason someone were to approach the service and, and say that as transfusion medicine um, providers, it may be a little bit at odds with what we would recommend. So being mindful of that and seeing that it's out there is really helpful. So I switched to a couple of other things that I know we see as thresholds, white blood cells and absolute neutrophil count thresholds. I started noticing that ANC thresholds were um, mentioned a lot or a lot more than I actually thought originally. And of course it's variable and most of them didn't mention it at all, but um, more studies mentioned ANC than they did white blood cell count. And just to throw it out there, lymphocytes are under the ALC or absolute lymphocyte count category. So while this is important for patients to have adequate white blood cells and adequate neutrophil counts for their general overall status, it may not necessarily equate to whether or not we can have a successful apheresis collection, at least based on the parameters we know and use these days. That being said, Thresholds were set, and many of them were variable. So now going back to the first example I showed you of coding, where you've got laboratory requirements that relate to apheresis, looking at the middle three, the absolute lymphocyte count in the pink, the complete blood count in the green, and the T cell count in the, in the uh, purple over to the left-hand side, I teased them out into a table just to put it all out there because I figured it was enough that could fit on one slide. And you can see there's qualitative and quantitative um, thresholds that are set. And they're kind of 
all in the same ballpark, but kind of different categories and they're not all the same. Um, in one of them, it was a C CD3 positive T cell count of 107 uh, per microliter. And ALC count of 100 per microliter varied uh, as the low threshold in the middle column up to 500 per microliter. And then with CBCs over on the right-hand side, you can see lifted out the white blood cell counts, hemoglobins and platelets of 80,000. And that's interesting to me because I don't know, um, you know, various requirements for platelet thresholds, but 80,000 uh, could, could well exceed the threshold we need to proceed with platelets. And again, lower than that, I can see platelets of 75,000 here as well. And then qualitative. So absolute lymphocyte count or CD3 count, ab adequate T cells, you can see inadequate. That allows for some flexibility. It may be defined elsewhere in these studies requirements. And uh, over here with CBCs, CBC within one week of donation. Okay, great. You can see that other than that, it's saying must be within a range that would not preclude donating blood or undergoing leukapheresis. That actually allows for a lot of flexibility. So I went through this uh, study and my eyes were definitely opened, but there are some big considerations and, and limitations to it that I wanna point out for uh, completion sake and for consideration. So I only looked at, basically I just cut down apheresis to get rid of all the extra words around it because I realized after playing around that this was the most consistent way to try to catch things outside of that or different variations on the word. References that weren't included, implied apheresis. So if they said something like lymphocyte collection, I wouldn't have gotten it. And if it said, uh, if it was completely misspelled, I also would not have gotten it. Um, it would not have been captured. It didn't differentiation. Uh, so although uh, clinicaltrials.gov does have clinical studies, there may be observational studies versus interventional, um, didn't differentiate versus autologous and allogeneic. The vast majority and the only way to collect FDA approved uh, CAR T cells right now are autologous, but many studies are looking at allogeneic. The time of study, the status of study, where the study was performed and if veriphoresis was primary or secondary collection method. Some places may try to collect for through phlebotomy and then go to apheresis after. And then, of course, the use of clinicaltrials.gov is its, itself is a source of uh, limitation, where it includes more than just clinical trials. Uh, Follow-up studies might be on separate records. There are mandatory elements, but there's a lot of optional data elements as well. Records can be modified at any time by the responsible party, hence the date stamps and the, the time stamps of when we looked at things. And um, clinicaltrials.gov doesn't have all the information, and it may not. So keeping all of that in mind, still some new information to me. And so what are some things that are that people are working on to try to make this better? Um, lots of things. There's national efforts. There's international efforts. It's a really exciting time to be a part of this process and this discussion because we really are setting the stage for now and the future. So the standards coordinating body is one example of a group that is trying to establish standards, and that is to help manufacturers uh, have a guideline to follow. And you can see just a summary of findings. Uh, don't read this point for point, but you can see that there's subtopics that they've identified regarding cellular collection of um, T uh, C cellular therapy manufacturing. So what parameters do you need? How do you request collection volume? What about changes that happen? Um, what testing needs to happen? Minimum requirement for facilities and equipment. You can see here they actually listed an example of CD34 enumeration ability. We've been talking about T cells the entire time. However, you may be aware that there are actually two um, new cell therapy products that really recently just got um, approval for um, hematopoietic stem cell genetic modification for patients with uh, hemoglobinopathies. And uh, so now that's a whole other world we should be looking at and are already looking at. CD34, these are patients now who undergo a different process. It's a different cell. So we're having to expand that, that vision even further. So another example is uh, the Deloitte Industry Working Group. So this is a group that um, is looking at uh, identifying challenges facing operations and aligning on key key objectives 
to really try to get best practice practices to optimize and standardize outcomes as well. So it's a it's a really exciting time and a lot of people are paying attention to this and recognize the importance. Don't read this entire slide, please. What I'd like to just uh, point out to you is that there is a whole slide full of words here that are only talking about apheresis collection for um, cell and gene therapies, which is exciting. So the um, UK Advanced Therapy Treatment Center Network Standard Approach, uh, they have ATMP tissue collection projects and they establish guidelines. And here you can see there's a couple of things that it was exciting to see written on paper as guidelines. So you can see there's um, suggested inlet anticoagulation ratios. There's suggested um, way to look at flushes and how to um, receive information and give information. And this is really exciting. Um, something that I think uh, the apheresis community and the cell therapy community are all um, benefiting from. And the American Society for Apheresis, this is an example as well, um, trying to get white papers and uh, guidances out for public consumption to try to help inform the community and also hopefully inspire further conversation. So this is an example white paper that actually got input from the AABB, the ASTCT, ISCT, FACT, and NMDP. That was an alphabet soup, but these are really important stakeholders in the th cellular therapy community. And so to have their input and endorsement is super important. And so some considerations, uh, Don't you don't have to read that whole thing on the right-hand side. I just wanted to show it to you in its completed uh, state where we offered some considerations for onboarding before collection of apheresis, during collection, after collection, and then of course, quality assurance. Because as we're working with clinical studies and cellular therapy products, we all recognize the importance of the documentation and the regulatory requirements that are critical to ensure success as cell therapy products move through those phases. And then bringing it down to kind of the local process, this was a paper that was uh, published by some colleagues about cellular therapy lab. But I actually have, uh, I take this and I actually say, imagine apheresis in this, in this context as well. Um, we really have to be involved through the entire process of cell therapy studies and be included as a stakeholder before the study starts, right? The process of actually bringing studies online can take six months or more. Um, the roles, CTL and apheresis are oftentimes customized to each study and uh, during the study period. Lots of the processes are manual. Some of these things need to be individualized to each patient. And so being mindful of that and touching base frequently with the stakeholders is important. And of course, record maintenance and um, ongoing regulatory requirements to support studies is important too. And you can see it's a multi-step process and a lot of these steps actually have, have to happen well before the studies even go live. And so how can we make sure that the people who are trying to do these studies are aware of that so that we can help ensure success for them and everyone involved? So getting back to the basic question of why, why is this so important? Why did I just spend 45 minutes talking to you about variability in apheresis collections and how we can manage these as an overall service? So I haven't even touched upon standard of care cell therapies today. Um, and those are the hematopoietic progenitor cell collections. And on the left-hand side, I just put a growth, basically a growth chart here, showing you the, the growth of uh, hematopoietic cellular therapies over time. This goes up to 2020. But the, uh, and you can see the little dip during COVID, but that general trend is the same, where it's growing, and it continues to grow. On the right hand side, you can see the number of CAR T cell infusions, this takes you through 2021 at the time it was uh, done. But you can see that trajectory is also going up and up and up. So how do we handle these volumes? Because these are all patients. Cell therapy under clinical development, it is exploding. So this was the slide I talked to you about earlier where I did that study. We, when we did that study, it was in 2020. And that was a snapshot in time. And it's over double that now. So the count this morning, I think was 
1933. So over a thousand uh, five hundred studies listed on uh, clinicaltrials.gov today. So it's well over doubled. And that trajectory is just continuing to grow. And that was just CAR T cell clinical studies that was not including the other studies that I'm sure are also growing, such as the hematopoietic progenitor um, cell gene editing studies and others that I haven't even mentioned. And bringing it under a, a little bit more local. So I crunched these numbers this morning because I, I try to do this on a regular basis. And so looking at on the left-hand side at the table, we group our studies as year of IRB because that gives us at least a predictable way to look at things and a consistent way of looking at things. And so the number of active studies that went live per year, you can see one in 2011, and then things started to really get, uh, get going in the 2020s. Number of pending studies, you're going to see most of these actually moved over to be active. So the zeros are a good thing. And um, well, in 2023, we had over a, a, a dozen as of actually yesterday, when I was looking at this, there's 12 that are either pending with an IRB uh, or number of studies on radar. There's also seven that don't have an IRB yet. So that's 19 in total that are not active, but on our radar. And then the number of studies closed. I put this here, and this is a new addition when I looked at this, because I started realizing I wasn't taking into account the ones that aren't on our radar anymore, but that we did have to do things about. Because of course, when you have a study closed, that implies you opened it and that you maintained it. And so you did have to put attention to it. And so you can see there was a lot. And so the cumulative number really starts to rise. And so looking at the bottom total cumulative of number of active pending studies on radars and closed, that's 136 studies that our cell therapy lab has touched in some way, shape or form since 2011. And then the total per year in this column is actually translated over to this right-hand graph where you can just see the cumulative number of studies because if a study's open, it requires attention. And so it is actually a cumulative effect that studies have. And so it's important to keep in mind that as we grow, we have to continue to maintain as well so that we can support all of the processes. And this is just showing, uh, the, so the Center for Gene and Cell Immune Therapy is something that WashU established um, and we're a part of it. The Pharesis Center is a part of it. The Cellular Therapy Lab is a part of it. And um, it's a part of the, it's basically a comprehensive group that brings together clinicians, laboratories, uh, and different services to talk about studies well before they go live, to anticipate the needs of the studies, and how we can best support them and grow along with them. So that's a really I think a positive note to kind of land on where despite all of the unknowns and despite all of the factors that we have yet to learn about or what's to come, this is a really exciting time and collaboration and communication is really key. And so the more we can do to help encourage that, the better. So bringing us back to the tangled web of the complexity of multiple studies with multiple sites, we hope to align the processes a little bit. That's the overall goal. And really just open up the lines of communication with the sites, with the studies, with our clinical colleagues, and with um, just sort of in a 360 approach, if you will. So with that, I'd like to thank um, the Immune Effector Cell Subcommittee on uh, the American Society for Apheresis who uh, let me do this project with them. Uh, you all at the University of Minnesota for inviting me to speak here today, uh, all of the clinical study investigators that uh, contributed their data to the clinicaltrials.gov and are continuing to work towards these cell therapies uh, in a comprehensive way, and um, you for your attention. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Susie. That was great. Um, any questions? Looks like Dr. Crossman. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I'm on the IRB at the University of Minnesota, and uh, our panel sometimes obviously sees some of these uh, studies on CAR T cells. And I have a couple of observations, and I want to ask you a, basically a question about how the IRB should be looking at the CAR T cell studies. For, first of all, um, my one of my observations is that uh, a number of people on the panel 
really don't understand what uh, apheresis is. And, and the other observation I have is that when we looked at potential complications for uh, patients, uh, the only thing I can remember that, that was ever on the complications was uh, hypocalcemia. And so um, what, what are your comments about how the IRB should be approaching these CAR T-cell studies? Thank you for that question. Um, I can tell you what we do, what we actually have evolved at the IRB part. And since I've been there, since 2017, one thing the IRB protocol uh, you have to answer for is whether or not um, cell therapies are a part of it. And if that question box is checked, it automatically gets routed to um, the CGCI to review it. Um, and that is something that I think has been extremely powerful because before that button existed, that one little button, we were learning of things, um, you know, in a very practical sense, it's really hard to learn about things uh, when you don't have, when they're pressed for time and they have pressure to start and you don't have the information ready to be able to do it or the capacity. That one button helped not only with that part, but it helped with that part of your what you're getting to where now there are experts who are looking for things and used to looking for things and it adds an extra layer. Um, before then, I'm actually not really sure what that process was. So that's how WashU has um, tried to address that. And I think it's been really effective because we have, um, we do have a research coordinator within our department of labs that actually, I'd say 90% of what she does is cell therapies, even though she is for the entire lab. And she gets alerted to it, as does the CGCI coordinator as well. That's really helped a lot. Um, but uh, you're right, one of the major adverse reactions for apheresis is hypocalcemia. Um, those of us who practice apheresis, yes, there's others that might be of consideration that are mentioned during the informed consent process, but that's one of the most clinically apparent uh, and common that we do see. Yeah, well, thank you. That's a really interesting idea. I don't, I'm sure we don't do that here at the University of Minnesota, as far as I can tell. We have something similar with like um, when it involves different like lab services, you know, like whether it's cell therapy lab or blood bank or whatever, um, where things get triggered so that everyone everyone is on the same page. It, you know, overall, I'm sure it could probably improve still. I think things are getting better. Like Susie, like you said, your last few slides, like because you've highlighted and I think like what Teddy did is abstract um, in last the past year. Um, really kind of highlighted the need for involvement by transfusion medicine and apheresis experts yes. in this activity. And it really kind of showed us that they're really not involved. And that's kind of comes to play with all those kind of um, kind of like questions you had, like, I'm not sure why they included this with, you know, if it probably because they didn't have people like you on, on these, uh, <laughs> on these protocol committees. So, um, but it's getting better. I think. Any other questions? All right. Well, I think it's right about, is it right around nine o'clock now? Um, well, I want to thank you, Susie, for joining our Grand Rounds and giving a, a great talk this morning. And thank thank you. you all again for having me. It was really a pleasure. Uh, maybe next time I can come see you all in person. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. But I know in mid-February, you're probably thinking it, it's 30 degrees, but it could have been minus 30 today, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> <laughs> but right. thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.